welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations and co-convened with Switzerland, the goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. And welcome to this AI for Good session on Towards the Fusion Energy with the help of AI. Many thanks to our speakers, Dr. Christina Rea, Professor Jeff Schneider, Dr. Mikkel Bindebauer, and Dr. Uh, Jonas Buckley for accepting our invitation. I'm Dr. Matteo Barbarino. I'm the Nuclear Fusion Specialist at the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IAEA is the World Center for Cooperation in Nuclear Field and seeks to promote the peaceful uses and applications of nuclear technology. This AI for Good session will give an overview of AI applications in modeling of fusion plasma dynamics from experimental data and plasma simulations, inviting some of the key developers and leaders in this area. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, TAE Technologies, and DeepMind. The format will be a sequence of four talks. Please type your questions and comments into the neural network chat, and we will try to go through those during the session. So let me get started by welcoming Dr. Christina Rea, a research scientist at MIT, uh, who will introduce a new IAEA project focusing on advancing fusion science discovery with AI. Over to you, Christina. Thank you, Matteo. Let me just uh, quickly share my screen here. Okay, let's go full screen. Um, all right. Okay, thank you. Good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening uh, to you all connected virtually to this webinar. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, of being here today to uh, contribute to the session on towards fusion energy with the help of AI. So I was given the opportunity to present a brief summary of how IEA is actually supporting the nuclear fusion community to boost uh, its research progress through AI. So let, let's just uh, dive uh, right into it. Uh, just a refresher, uh, fusion research is aiming at realizing long-term clean energy solution that leverages the nuclear reaction powering the core of our stars. In our laboratories on Earth, though, we are actually pursuing fusion by fusing hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium through um, uh, two main approaches, uh, or um, the magnetic confinement one, which entails the heating and uh, confinement via magnetic fields of the plasma fuel and the inertial uh, confinement approach, which employs highly energetic laser beams uh, to heat and compress the fuel target. Now, uh, this fusion communities, the fusion community really produces a huge amount of experimental and simulation data, which lends itself uh, fairly well to AI applications. Um, data drives fusion experiments from their design uh, to analysis and optimization. Here I'm showing an example of how AI models can actually be used to aid experimental uh, MFU operations, magnetic uh, confinement fusion operations, by combining simulations and experimental uh, data to inform scientists about the operational space that needs to be probed uh, next in the following experiments. AI can indeed play a key role in science discovery by exploiting the availability of such big data sets. It can bridge gaps in our theoretical understanding through the identification of missing effects and patterns in data. It is also important to uh, highlight how pushing the methodological development of AI algorithms uh, by pushing that forward, a strong integration is also needed with state-of-the-art um, uh, hardware solutions, for example, um, embedded computing, high-performance computing accelerators and such. 
uh, AI is becoming an intrinsic asset of fusion workflows for plasma performance and optimization, for event and anomaly detection, for plant operation monitoring, for example. Next generation devices might indeed uh, take advantage of AI driven predictive modeling in order to uh, monitor in real time the plasma boundary and the plasma pro proximity to uh, the boundaries of stability. Um, and we will see uh, several examples and contributions during today's webinar. Uh, to develop such data-driven solutions, uh, interpretability needs to be preserved. Uh, black box models may have limited relevance, for example, when we think about real-time applications. Uh, and what we would like to have is really a well-defined valid region for the predictive output of such algorithms with clear extrapolation boundaries, as well as uncertainties associated to the output of our models uh, in order to validate the algorithm's reliability. These requirements all push the fusion, fusion scientists and the fusion community to employ or, or develop the state-of-the-art solutions, also by partnering with private uh, companies. The development, however, the development of AI applications really highlights uh, existing bottlenecks in uh, the fusion community that are actively preventing us from accelerating our research advancements. In particular, data and data accessibility. Uh, big databases are needed for uh, machine learning and AI model uh, training, validation, and testing. However, there is some hesitancy to share data and data sets due to ownership and security issues, uh, laboratory um, uh, ownership and intellectual property issues as well, or the fear of being scooped. Um, a robust infrastructure is needed in order to share data analysis routines are needed in order to uh, curate such databases too and need to be shared as well. Uh, another uh, bottleneck is really about community engagement. We often are scattered around in our um, and tend to duplicate our efforts in sub communities inside Fusion. So we really want to create one community of practice that is focused on developing, developing AI applications in Fusion. And then workforce development. Um, uh, fusion subject matter experts often approach um, the development of AI applications with uh, little knowledge, um, particularly about uh, the technological, the methodological algorithms. So they need reskilling. And we can actually contribute to fixing this by educating a diverse workforce with diverse curricula and uh, try to, uh, to compete then and retain such talents by competing with respect to the industry in terms of salaries. Anyways, IEA can actually play a significant role in addressing such bottlenecks, uh, becoming a data steward for open science uh, through the realization of uh, a coordinated research project that is aimed at democratizing data access, ensuring best practices, um, and uh, as well as adherence to ethical principles in the fusion community. In particular, IA can um, enhance a large scale accessibility by hosting common data sets, improving connectivity among data source institutions and uh, countries uh, and the actual users, as well as fostering dedicated workshops on AI and creating new ways to engage the fusion community. This will enable also broader participation in the nuclear sciences and applications and diversifying the knowledge and skill base in order to accelerate progress in fusion research via AI. More in particular about the CRP, this coordinated research project, this is developed um, around four main pillars. Uh, its title is AI for Accelerating Fusion R&D. These four pillars are centered around NFE applications, IFE applications, common interests activity, and um, uh, a common community engagement and workforce development activity. Uh, it's uh, built in order to tackle common challenge and provide common solution. And uh, although currently um, the timeline spans the next five years, it's been approved uh, and it's about to start. Um, this can also lead to a more uh, to continuation efforts beyond the five years and a more permanent effort. Going a bit more into the details of what are the topics that we will be developing in this CRP, uh, the focus will be to establish on establishing a multi-machine database of experimental and simulation data adherent to fair and open science principles, but also to develop uh, examples and uh, for a potential research manual to share it online, with the expected impact of increasing the data reproducibility and accessibility across domains for the international community, as well as increasing access to knowledge and information about AI methods in fusion. 
Similarly, in the IFV community, we will be developing a, a, um, a similar multi-machine database of experimental and simulation data in order to advance physics understanding of IFV plasmas um, with similar expected impacts. Now, on the uh, common interest activity, we will be focusing on a feasibility study of a joint database of uh, MFE and IFE image data. Uh, still adherent to FAIR and open science principles in order also to explore common data reduction tools for image data uh, in the fusion communities. The expected impact here is to really bridge the fusion and computer vision communities through um, the availability, the creation of a joint MFE and IFE image database. Lastly, about the community engagement and workforce development pillar, we will be establishing and, sustain and sustaining a digital platform for innovation, innovation and partnership on AI for fusion and plasma research. Uh, thus establishing also reference documents for education, training and capacity building in the application of AI methods. And um, this will have as a consequence to leverage or create new IEA internships, fellowships and scientific visits, uh, the actual repository of research papers published on subject as well as making it more accessible, the um, uh, research manuals on examples of AI applications and methods in fusion. Uh, the AI for Fusion CRP is online. Our first coordination meeting is expected to occur in December this year. Uh, and the applications are now open. So feel free to reach out and contact Matteo for further uh, questions on how to join and participate in the CRP process. AI is actually acknowledged as a transformative technology with multidisciplinary field implications that require coordination. This AI for Fusion CRP uh, shares many relevant synergies with the AI for Good initiative uh, that is hosting us today and can be seen as actually a stepping stone uh, towards establishing the foundations for continued innovation in AI for nuclear science and applications. Moving to centralized data repositories, for example, with standardized metadata can open participation to communities worldwide and attract AI experts to pivot on nuclear science projects. Uh, adhering to open science, uh, best practices and fair principles can be a turning point for leveraging AI capabilities in nuclear science and applications and can serve as um, uh, to guide actually data producers in order to share not just the data, as I mentioned before, but also the algorithms, the tools and the workflow that allow all components of the research and development process to be uh, reproducible, uh, transparent and reusable. Something that is already available in different other communities. Additionally, promoting open science policies, uh, policies and initiatives uh, can help reduce the technological and um, uh, knowledge gaps, which is one of the key objectives um, in, outlined by the recent UNESCO uh, report on recommendations on open science. All right, I think I'm about to run through my allowed time, so I will definitely leave the floor to uh, the other speakers. I just wanted to acknowledge um, all um, the effort of all the active organizers and participants uh, that made um, this coordinated research project a reality. And so thank you, uh, Matteo. Thank you, Christina, for this quick overview of the new IA project on uh... AI for accelerating fusion. Um, I'm sure we don't have a lot of time today because the format is a series of talks and we want to give uh, also uh, room to the other speakers, uh, but uh, I'm sure there will be uh, in the future other, opp other opportunities for to hear more about the project uh, in, the, in the same within the AI for good. So we will hear more from, from on this topic in the future. Now we move to the first technical talk of today, uh, we have uh, Professor Jeff Schneider from Carnegie Mellon University, who will tell us about reinforcement learning from self-driving car to control fusion. Over to you, Jeff. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, so as you just heard from Christina, uh, there's a big opportunity for AI to make an impact on, on fusion. Um, I have an interesting perspective on that because uh, in addition to my current work on fusion, 
my past work was helping Uber start their self-driving car program. And I spent about three years with them doing that. Um, so what I'm going to do is describe how AI is having a big impact on that uh, challenging problem in a physical system, and then map that over to how we can do this on Fusion. So, uh, so let me jump right in. Um, and so this is one of our self-driving cars. Uh, really, the point is, I'm not going to go through all of this. The point is just that it's got a lot of sensors on it, uh, radars, cameras, lidars, lots of things. And it's got a lot of compute. You can't see it. It's sitting in the trunk of this car. Um, but it has to process all that and make smart decisions. The same problem we have uh, with running fusion devices. Now, that the, the classical architecture uh, for a self-driving car is heavily, makes heavy use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I'm just going to flip through all of that just, uh, just, just to give you the idea. So, so these cars start by localizing themselves, and they have a prior map of where they expect to drive. And they just compare their sensor data with the data in their map to see where they are. So after they've done that, they run a perception system, uh, which you can see the car, the self-driving cars, the wireframe, everything else is being tracked. All the other vehicles, the yellow circles are, pe are people. And that corresponds to the task of sensing in real time the state of the plasma and the other things of interest going on uh, in a fusion device. Uh, again, this is all machine learning based. We collect lots of data to train the models that do this kind of recognition and tracking of state. The next thing that happens in a self-driving car is having identified all the actors in the scene, we wanna predict where they're going to go next. And so, this annotation shows a bunch of lines coming out of the different actors, which are the predictions about where they'll, where they'll go next in the scene. And again, this is equivalent to modeling the dynamics of a fusion plasma so that we can reason about what will happen next if we take various, uh, various actions in the, uh, in the scene. The next thing that happens is in a self-driving car is motion planning. And so here you have an example of uh, of a car planning a lane change here. And again, the analogy in a fusion plasma is thinking about the current state, the predicted behavior of the plasma, and what action you might take and what effect it will have. And in fact, that's what a car does. It uses something that's analogous to, to model predictive control. If, uh, if we're the blue car here, it basically hypothesizes a bunch of actions we might take and what might happen if we took them. And then it goes down and analyzes them all and picks the one that it thinks will, will work out the best. And it takes the first step on that path. And then it just iterates and repeats the whole process again. In the case of a self-driving car, uh, about 10 times a second. Uh, again, the, in a plasma, uh, we're just starting to see some model predictive uh, control used in, in controlling plasmas as well. For cars, if this all goes well, uh, you get the whole scene together. So here, here's an example of one of our cars driving around in, in traffic. I'm going to show you a more interesting example in a second, so, so I'll, just, uh, I'll just skip past this one. There's an interesting question, though. You guys, uh, you got the blitz of the traditional autonomy architecture here. But we've been talking about AI and machine learning, so an obvious question is, wow, that was complicated. Uh, couldn't we just do that instead? Put one giant neural network over the whole thing and just forget all those millions of lines of code that went into everything else. It turns out the answer is yes. Uh, this is called imitation learning. What we do is we have human drivers just drive the cars around and we collect a whole pile of data from our sensors and we pair them up with what the human did. So now we have a match when the car saw this from its cameras, this is what the human decided to do when they, when they were driving the car. And we just train a neural network to mimic that. And that works as well. Um, here's an example of this happening. This is one of, these, uh, one of these cars driving. The green check under the steering wheel means that it's driving itself. Uh, it's fine. It follows along, uh, does merges, that kind of thing. And there's almost no software here. There's almost no code here, I should say. It's really just a neural net looking at the cameras and making all the decisions. Um, this works fine in rain. 
Uh, this one's fun because it's actually driving with all those rain raindrops on its uh, on its camera lens. Um, the actual lane lane following was done here at CMU, literally going back to the to the 80s. Uh, so that's not hard. And the and the thinking was that uh, maybe imitation learning can't do anything more complex, but actually that's not true either. Here's a very very early video um, of you can see we don't even have enough data to stabilize the steering yet. But nonetheless, it's following the cars in front of us. It comes up to a stop sign, uh, lets the car go in front of us, uh, waits there while the car takes a left, uh, then waits for this truck to pass, uh, and then goes on. And again, there's no logic here. It's not reasoning about when did I arrive and what turn, you know, when is it my turn? It's literally just mimic the, mimicking what it's seen human drivers do. So that's... Uh, Pretty fascinating from, from self-driving car point of view. I, I wanna jump over and just talk about the autonomy development process because when you use the classical architecture, it's slow and painful. So what happens? You look at your software, you find some mistakes it, it's made and you have an engineer improve the software. Then they have to check against a bunch of regression tests to see if they made the improvement and broke anything. So here's a replay where you can see there's two cars, a colored one and a network one. One is what the original car did in the log and one is what the, what the new one does with the software change. So that check happens. If that goes well, maybe we do the same thing in simulation to test some other scenarios. If that goes well, we put it on the track. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the track here. Um, normally, even on the track, we have safety drivers in the cars at all times. Um, but it is a closed track, so we wouldn't really need to have those safety drivers. And in this video, there is no driver in the seat of any of these vehicles that you see in the video. And so this just gives you an idea of all the testing that, that goes on here. Um, what you'll see as this proceeds is you'll see uh, some of the challenges we put up for the car to deal with. There's other, you see the traffic lights, the obstacles, there's other actors in the scenes. We have, we have remote controlled bikes, uh, pedestrians, uh, stopped vehicles, buses, all of those things we can test on this track uh, in order to make sure things like this happen. And so the, the interesting perspective there is, uh, this is something self-driving cars have gotten right that Fusion still hasn't quite gotten to a point. We do multiple code builds a day and test them every day on the track. We have lots of cars, lots of ability to test. Um, and so that allows us to advance very quickly on how well self-driving cars uh, operate. That's in contrast to the current state with Fusion where we really only have a very small number of very expensive devices around the world where we would probably be better served uh, with more devices that were less expensive so we could collect more data and do more experiments. Nonetheless, if all goes well, you get to a, uh, a, a fleet-wide deployment. Here's a classical chart card problem. When can I pass the bike? Can I go past them now? No, nope, they need to get back in the lane. Uh, maybe I can pass them at the intersection. No, nope, now they get back in the lane. Maybe here, yep, now I can pass them. So these are the kind of subtle thing, things that our self-driving cars get right now that are a challenge. Okay, so I gave you a blitz of some successes with self-driving cars, but what's left? We still have to solve that long tail of rare events and scale the system across many domains in order to get these things working. And that is an extremely engineer intensive effort. Uh, again, very similar to what we're going through in Fusion right now. A lot, of, a lot of work goes into this. So what are we doing? We're moving over to a way to solve this as we know, there have been many excess successes with reinforcement learning. We've seen the, the Go player from DeepMind. We've seen the StarCraft player from DeepMind. The, uh, the OpenAI work on manipulating things, those are recent successes. In fact, reinforcement learning and Bayesian optimization has uh, successes going back quite a while ago. The uh, snake learning to climb over that obstacle is from my lab from a decade ago. That helicopter is from two decades ago before quad rotors even became popular. So it learned to fly from data using reinforcement learning um, and, and was very effective at that. So 
<clears throat> the obvious question is, well, maybe we could use reinforcement learning for cars as well. And this is in fact what we're doing now in my lab. So these, I'm not gonna go through all these videos, but these are all cars that have been, that have been trained in this simulator to drive using reinforcement learning. So you can see them doing the usual things, the traffic lights, the, the turns, the navigations, the lane changes, the merges, uh, all of those things can be done in reinforcement learning. Of course, now what we really wanna do is fusion plasmas, right? And so you got a little bit of introduction from, from Christine already, so I don't need to say too much about it, but, but of course, what we would like to do, we're focusing on, on tokamax in our case, uh, we have a plasma that's controlled by magnets and other actuators, and we'd like to stably keep it at high temperatures and pressures so we get fusion to happen. Um, why is this difficult? It's difficult because the dynamics are complex, a combination of, of uh, electromagnetics and fluid dynamics. And at the temperatures and pressures we're interested in, it's very unstable. So I listed just one of many instabilities and other problems that have to be dealt with in order to maintain a, a, a fusion plasma. Now, what we would like to do is use the things I described, reinforcement learning, in order to learn how to control that tokamak. Now, as I said, we don't have very many devices and, and time uh, on them is, is, uh, is very oversubscribed. So what we're gonna do instead is learn this on simulators and on data-driven models. Um, and then we'll hope, then we'll look to deploy that on a real tokamak. And so what does it mean building a model? Well, I'm, I'm gonna get into the details of what we did later, but basically we have some plasma state and we're gonna take some action and we would like to know what's the next plasma state gonna be as a result of that action. Now you, you, you might ask, well, uh, how, how do we build that model? Well, well there's two sort of uh, differing approaches. One is you build it up from scientific first principles. And that would usually produce the kinds of simulators we're used, used to. The other is you would learn it from data um, and, just, and just try to learn that mapping directly from data from your device. Of course, it would be even better if we did both. So in my lab, in fact, we've done that. Um, we've uh, uh, built up neural network structures that include uh, differential equation solvers inside the neural network so that you can plug in any known science uh, into your network and it'll run the differential equation solver for you. But by the training of deep networks, we also pass gradients through to adjust parameters. And that allows us to add components like what in this section is called the residual prediction at the top um, and uh, the parameter estimation uh, at the left. And what that allows us to do is tweak all this and cover all the dynamics that weren't correctly modeled by our, by our first principles equation to get something that performs better than either of these two by themselves. So this is a paper we published in CDC. Uh, what, what it shows is just some simple plasma dynamics uh, measuring stored energy and, and rotation. The plot on the right shows the error in modeling that. And the important thing is, uh, our method is the cyan bar, the little one. And the other thing to point out is that the, the Y scale is a log scale. So our model is a lot better than the previous methods of, of modeling this, this kind of data. Okay, now, but what we wanna do is formulate this as a reinforcement learning problem. And so what that means is we're gonna, we're gonna formulate something called a Markov decision process. It has a state space, which is the information about the, the plasma, an action space, which are the actuators we can apply, uh, the beams that, uh, um, the, that in, inject neutral beams into it, the, the magnets that control the shape of it. We have a reward function, which says, how are we doing in terms of tracking the plasma state we want or maintaining stability or getting a high performance out of, out of the plasma? And of course, we have the, the dynamics of it, which we're going to use our learned model. So what are the actual states we have and what are the actual actuators? We, we have this model that will take in the current states and actions and the previous states and actions and try to predict the next state. The same as that neural network I, I, I just showed you previously that was modeling the plasma. We can train this 
using historical data from D3D, which is the tokamak in San Diego that we're targeting. <clears throat> the state variables, these are things like the, 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 the strange pink thing you see there is a cross section of the, of the plasma in the tokamak. And so many of the things we measure as a slice of that plasma. And so it's actually a, a curve along that slice. And so the rotation is measured that way, the temperature, the density, the pressure, um, safety factor, these are measured as curves. And what we do is we use PCA to reduce those curves down to two or four components. There are also scalars that we measure in the plasma, uh, the plasma pressure, uh, internal induct inductance, uh, electron density, those are measured as scalars. So all those are the current state of a plasma. Now the actuators we, we uh, alluded to before, um, you can see there that we have the ability to, uh, uh, to inject into the plasma uh, neutral beams that will change the rotation of it um, <clears throat> and, uh, and the total power that's added to the plasma, excuse me. <clears throat> there are other controls in terms of the current that you drive in the, in the plasma, the density of it and the magnetic fields. <clears throat> Another thing you do is, is, is control the shape of the plasma using the magnets. And so we show the, cha the shape there. Now, I think we're gonna hear in the, in the third talk today, some recent work about using reinforcement learning to, to control that shape with the magnets. Uh, it's very exciting. And so what we do for this work is we assume we have the ability to do that control, um, that, that we can just choose the shape we want. Um, and those methods will produce the shape. Now, when we model the dynamics of this, it's very important to consider the uncertainty in our model. So here's some work we utilized uh, to improve the uncertainty estimates in our dynamic model. I'm not gonna go into the detail here, but it essentially creates a whole ensemble of possible models that we can sample from that are all slightly different dynamics because we wanna make sure our controller will handle anything, any plausible real model of the, of the plasma once we get to the real one. There's a big challenge in using reinforcement learning in simulation, which is how do you guarantee that it works okay? When we do supervised learning, we do a train and test set. You train on one data set, you see how well you predict another data set you haven't seen yet. Here we have dynamic models, so it's a different, little bit different scene, but nonetheless, we do an analogous thing. We train one dynamic model on 90% of the data. We then train our policy to control that dynamic model. And now to see if we've got an actually robust policy, we train a new dynamic model that adds the extra 10% of the data from the test set. And we also start our, our plasma state in a state from that test set, in a state that the model's never seen before. And then we run our policy on that to see if it performs well. So that's how we test the robustness of it before we get to the real device. <clears throat> now you can see what happens here. Here we are replaying a test shot, one that, that we didn't see during training. And we just wanna see, did we produce a good model? So what you're seeing across the top is all those plasma states, those 1D curves, the dash line is the real state, and the blue lines are what our model thinks will happen as this shot plays out. If you look at the middle graph, what, what you're seeing there is the pressure of the plasma, and this is a normal shot. What happens is it starts low, it gets ramped up, and we try to maintain it uh, at some flat top value um, for an extended period of time. And you can see here, we managed to model this shot pretty well. Not maybe surprising because this shot, although it's not in our training data, we have lots of training data that looks roughly like this shot. We also wanted to see if, if our model was good enough to model other things. So this is an unusual shot. Uh, in this case, what they did was they ramped up the pressure and then ramped it, ramped it back down again for a while and then ramped it up again. And, you, and so we don't have a lot of shots like this in our training data at all because nobody runs a tokamak like this. And so, but here again, our model uh, is able to, to um, replay this well. 
So what we do then is we're going to run reinforcement learning. We will sample dynamics models. We'll, we, we have a controller and we'll sample trajectories from that controller. And then using reinforcement learning and gradient descent, we'll update our, our policy incrementally over lots of trials of this to get a good performing uh, policy. We compare this over classical controllers. Uh, for those of you that are reinforcement learning uh, folks, we used a version of software, Soft Actor Critic as our RL learner, and we also used a version of PPO uh, as, as our learner for this. And we're comparing against PID, which is a classical control method uh, that's relatively common in, in, in Pokemax. And what we're seeing here is that both on the training model and the test model, uh, our reinforcement learning controller is able to get much better performance uh, than the classical baseline we've seen. We also did something else. We said, well, okay, what if we don't wanna track a target? What if we just wanna drive the plasma pressure as high as we can? Uh, and so we asked the reinforcement learner to learn how to do that. Now, what it did is maybe not too surprising. It turned up the power, it turned up the current, the density, everything, it just cranked it up. But it also did something smart with the, sh with the shape. Um, it changed the shape uh, to have this high triangularity, uh, which is something that, um, although the, the fusion community has learned that trick over many, many years at this point, we didn't tell it that, it just discovered that from, from the data. Uh, so that's also encouraging. Okay, so what are our plans here? Um, we have been allocated some time on the D3D tokamak this summer. We are training a controller to produce high differential rotation. Um, and so there's a theory that higher differential rotation will produce a more stable plasma if we can produce that, that, uh, that high differential rotation. So we have a policy that can do that and we're gonna test it on the, on the real device. And so our summary and next steps, reinforcement learning and Bayesian optimization um, shows a lot of promise. It's being used in self-driving cars now, and it now shows promise in our plasma simulations um, and in our learned dynamics models. And so we will be trying this out uh, on a real tokamak this summer. And as we get confidence in our ability to control plasmas, we'll move reinforcement learning from not only controlling to actually doing scenario design to really finding what are those completely different plasma configurations, uh, control strategies that might deliver higher performing plasmas. And so I'm super excited for the prospect of AI and reinforcement learning for fusion. Uh, and I know uh, lots of other people are getting increasingly excited about it as well. And so with that, um, I'll stop. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, if, if we do, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Jeff. Well, we certainly share your excitement. We're all excited. And I don't see any questions at the moment on the chat. So let's, uh, let me move, uh, move ahead. And then uh, if there's time, time allows, we'll come back for questions. So let me uh, now please welcome uh, Dr. Mikkel Bindabauer, CEO of TAE Technologies. Uh, and uh, Mikkel will tell us about how TAE has been using uh, AI in their experiments. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, let me share a little bit of our journey, dabbling, frankly, more into this. Um, there's a lot more work to do, as you've seen just uh, from Jeff. There's, there's obviously an enormous potential here. Let me give you a little journey about what we've been doing. So first, a little bit about um, who we are. We're actually a private company pursuing fusion since about 1998, uh, with quite a different topology than the Tokamax, and give you a little flavor of what that looks like. Uh, we have about 350 people working for us, lots of patents, of course, and, and now as a corporate environment, you have to also look for returning capital to people eventually, and so we're also pursuing spin-offs from Fusion uh, in various areas, amongst them, for instance, in power management, like leading to advancements in electric drivetrains and things like that, technology coming out uh, of Fusion. Well capitalized, these are expensive machines to build, um, and having one that we control completely allows us to amass a lot of data, at least on one machine, and we can control that process more. And so doing machine learning with data sets that approach hundreds of thousands of experiments was something that was inherent in, in, in what we wanted to achieve. 
Um, just a backdrop, of course, everybody knows this probably, but uh, the amount of energy demand that's going to come is going to be insane. And so fusion obviously will, will have a huge chance here to play a role in developing sort of carbon-free needs uh, of the world. And in particular, since most of that increase is going to be driven by the developing world, I think there's a huge opportunity here to do good in many ways. So um, TAE started really in this field with the intent to look towards what a commercial power plant ought to look like. So not just necessarily from what can we do scientifically today or when we started back in the late 90s as a company, but what, it, what would it look like to build a power plant? And so it was always very much attached to what the end in mind object, object, object it really is, which is practical power on the grid. So we were looking for something that can be clean and radioactivity free, uh, that can be operated safely. And of course it's zero carbon and also thinking of scale. Uh, one of the problems we typically run into in the field is, is the diffusive problem, losing energy and particles out. And so trying to build things that are more compact typically goes against the scaling. The scaling likes larger machines where you get to a longer time scales to run into that opportunity where you can perhaps make more power uh, than you consume. And consumption typically is defined mostly by, by losses in various channels out uh, from the confined material. And so trying to make things compact is a hard thing to do. But if you could, then you could reduce costs. Obviously, there's less material involved, less complexity in building things. They're smaller, et cetera. So um, just a quick overview here, and you've heard most of this already, but let me just say plasmas are very fickle. So you have to get to very high temperatures. Put a reference point here, right? The core of the sun is about 15 million degrees. Uh, terrestrial fusion occurs about 100 million plus. So we have to get into quite esoteric regime of temperature. And we have to, more importantly, not just quickly heat things there with an instantaneous jolt of energy in, but we have to keep it hot for substantially long periods. And whether this is um, uh, in the space of tokamaks or in what we're doing in the magnetic confinement regime, you're running sort of steady state, but the transient retention of energy, what we call it the energy confinement time, has to be on the order of seconds to hundreds of seconds, depending on, on the fuel you want to burn. So very long, stable, calm environments have to be produced with very minimalized heat loss. And this is a very big challenge. And if you can't do that, you will not get to efficient bulk fusion. And that means you will never generate more energy than you need. So the, the challenges are, as Jeff already showed, instabilities and what we call turbulence, which are sort of smaller wavelength scale effects that drive heat loss and uh, ultimately end up in a state where those are maintained at sufficient low levels that you can harvest more energy than it costs you to do. Uh, the machine that I'm going to show some data from, we call Norman. It was named after one of our co-founders, my PhD mentor, Dr. Norman Rostocker. Uh, it's about two double-decker buses inside size. Uh, it, it consumes about 750 megawatts when it runs. So quite a challenge to stage that kind of power. This is comparable to the output of a, of a relatively good size uh, industrial generating station. And today we're operating there at about 70 million degrees in the plasmas uh, we make, we, we, the plasma shots uh, we do in the current um, campaigns and environments. Uh, one other uh, sort of note uh, you've heard earlier about tutorium tritium. We're actually interested eventually go beyond that. And that's very challenging. So as I said, the 100 million degree mark gets you to tutorium tritium. If you want to go to something more clean, so to speak, less radioactive, less neutrons, that'd be something like hydrogen boron we're interested in, that requires about a billion degrees. So talking about turning a challenge up by another factor of 10, roughly, the benefits you get is you reduce the amount of radioactivity, you reduce the amount of damage that the machine can entail, and you get to more viable economics, of course. But the challenges are clear. Higher temperature, you get even into a regime where you have to be more worried about stability, and it turns out the amount of energy you can harvest, uh, as shown over here, and I won't dwell into the physics detail of this, but you have to, it basically burns slower and you get less energy out per reaction. So your energy accounting is more tight than it is, for instance, for the hydrogen, hydrogen isotopes, the tyrium tritium. So um, putting this together, our machine basically operates by making two plasmoids uh, on the axial lanes. They get fired together supersonically. They create a target that's rotating. And then we're firing in, as Jeff already described, neutral beams in this case. These are these sort of lightsaber looking um, objects here that come in from, from these cans of which we have eight uh, on the Norman machine. And those are imparting torque. So they let us rotate the plasma further. They're bringing in energy and particles and that allows us to also sustain. 
Now, it's also noteworthy that, as Jeff already said, there's things you can control. So for instance, here you can control the amount of beam injection. You can also choose where you inject in the sense that there are eight injectors. We can vary the physical location of where we fire with more intensity, make just the energy and the current independently to a degree. And we also can control the magnetic pressure. Uh, most of the magnetic pressure, of course, comes from these, what looks like these large red coils here, which are the, the main magnetic field coils. But then you have um, tons of little trim coils that allow you to vary slightly near the surface pressure so that you can you know, carefully uh, massage the plasma, the shape, and that means the elongation, for instance, the radial dimension, the curvature on it, et cetera. Uh, and also in the case of this machine, we have tools to control um, what, what we call in the field biasing or the um, electrostatic uh, potentials that develop on the edge of the plasma. So on the surface and outward, there are magnetic field lines. Think of this like layers of an onion, and you can actually charge these, uh, the different electric potentials, and that allows you to manipulate an electric field. And through interplay between an electric and a magnetic field, you can actually get shear. So in other words, you can change the rate of rotation, you can break it, you can accelerate it with the beams, and you can break it. And so you can think of a simple feedback loop. You would basically impart energy and rotation and, and torque with the beams. And if it over rotates, it would sort of tend to centrifugally fall apart, then you can slow it down by this means of biasing. We can also control then the shape, as I said, then we can also control the amount of fueling in addition to like gas injection or particles coming in with pellets. So those are the sort of things that we have control on during the shot. And in our machine, typically we can control these things on order of a millisecond. So thinking of the dynamics of a plasma, a lot of the things that we're trying to control are on time scales even shorter than that. So this is a challenge, but this is the best today we can do with circuit latencies and thinking that is involved by the machine tools. It takes about a millisecond plus or so to run a feedback loop. But it turns out uh, when you have some level of passive stability, meaning the thing tends to be grossly happy to sit there and rotate somewhat stably, then those sort of millisecond tweaks are sufficient, and as I'll show you in a moment, to do quite a few interesting things. So this is now where does machine learning come in. So we actually began a, a partnership back in the early 2010s with Google. Uh, we are not the world's best outfit on machine learning. We now have some sophisticated people in group, but back then uh, we were very rudimentary. And the thought was that if we bring in some people who do this for a living, perhaps we can actually accelerate the adoption of that um, and bring that in. And our first goal was really to figure out and how can we accelerate the rate of learning? You build these machines and then they take about five years to mature in terms of operating them. And so there's a lot of learning that, that occurs. And the thought was, if we can incrementally improve uh, on campaign to campaign, the rate of learning, then we can make serious um, efficiency improvements overall and can reduce the time it takes to reach a milestone or can innovate faster by having essentially ideas deployed very quickly and then either accepted or rejected based on, on data that comes. So optimization is actually a big part of, of the rate of learning. And so one of the things we want to do was see is could we would, would used to take us two months. So think for instance, you have a machine state that's defined by a thousand knobs being adjusted and you want to do your physics near the optimum point of that operational in that operational space. It may take you on the order of a couple of months to actually adjust these knobs as a human one at a time, right? It's a high, high dimensional optimization problem. Uh, if you can use efficient um, machine learning tools, for instance, and, and AI to optimize, you may be able to do much faster. And in fact, we've reduced that multi-month process down to fractions of a day today. So this is quite a sophisticated improvement. Uh, we developed something we'll call the optometrist algorithm, which I'll show you in a moment, which basically I was doing uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, to combine that process with the sort of human spark and creativity to accelerate the rate of learning. And then um, another vector I'm going to show you a little bit is on sort of holistic data, uh, data mining and reconstruction in a way what I call debugging the plasma. What is that we actually have? In other words, you have lots of diagnostics on all these machines. And so how can you bring all these data channels together efficiently um, that a human couldn't do? It's just way too much data, even on one shot, and then to parse all that together and, and, and deduce out of it the most likely plasma state during the operation and then time resolved. So why working with Google? I said already, well, obviously they have huge computational muscle. They've got a lot of um, data processing capability and inherent expertise. 
and they like moonshots. And in fact, TAE is sort of an epitome of a moonshot. So there was sort of a high degree of cultural alignment. Our strengths are really rapid experimentation. We do usually about 50, 60 shots a day. These are shorter shots. They're typically tens of milliseconds instead of sort of rounding seconds, but we can iterate very quickly. Uh, we've built about five integrated generations of machines now and just starting to build the sixth one. So there's a lot of data. There's, in this case here, a lot of is relative, but for Fusion, that's quite a good data set of about 200,000 experiments to work with. And that allows you then to work towards advancing the feedback control and those things I was talking about. And ultimately, the goal, of course, is to build a machine uh, where the energy that comes out is more than the energy that is in. We measure this in the field by what we call the Q factor. And uh, just for sort of benchmarking, nobody yet has reached break even. That's when the Q reaches about one, uh, but we have made steps to that. And when I talk about Q here, I'm actually really talking about the total of input power plus all the inefficiencies in the machine and what comes out. We're actually quite a ways away from that. We're getting close to the point where the input power into the plasma matches the output, but not quite when you look at it from the plug input to the output. Commercial success for us would mean we'd have to get on that metric to about five. So there's quite a while to go. Um, so what, Norman now has lots of opportunity to play with this, right? So first of all, how much plasma do you inject? How many particles do you carry? What's your ionization state? Voltage and timing of lots of things from coils to injectors to other things. What's the magnetic field like in the center, on the periphery? You can vary that. And then again, the, on the injectors, there's a lot of things you can control. So how do we go about that? Um, well, so this is sort of the idea. You, you start with a set of, um, this is for operational optimization. So you start with a point um, in your parameter space and you say, all right, let's perturb that with some noise and it gives us a new state. And that may not be a state that we want. Uh, it goes somewhere that the physicists or some abstract uh, measure that of goodness, of, of quality of the shot may not be where we want to go. And we retract back and then we take another shot somewhere uh, and this is where the, uh, the, uh, the, the machine learning comes in. It tries to predict based on data that we have, plus the results that we didn't like now, where should we perhaps try next? Gets to know the point, maybe, okay, that point is better. And then you take another iteration from there. Maybe you end somewhere you don't want to go and you track back again and you go on. So this eventually leads you to um, evolving up or down, depending on what you're optimizing against gradients to get to points where you end up with higher performance states. And the nice thing here is that on each of these steps, not only does the computer do modeling and prediction and decision making about what to try and what the parameters of the shot should be, but there's also the spontaneous operator observation. The human physicists that sit in the control room and say, I like this better than that. And so there's a mix between objective and subjective metrics that can also come in and this sort of spontaneity that the human can provide. And we learned that actually utilizing those two things in common, you actually can make more progress. A good example that we actually published uh, a few years ago in scientific reports is, the re is a regime that we found on the prior machine where we actually saw a heating opportunity, a heating regime developing with rising temperatures that we hadn't predicted the machine would be capable of. And it was certainly not in the parameter space or an operational setting that as humans trained in this, we would have we gone to. So the machine learning in this process of exploration not only led to a holistic exploration of the entire data set available, but it also actually led us therefore discover a regime that otherwise we wouldn't have come across. And so if you want to learn more about that, um, there's a reference here uh, for, for that set of experiments. Now, as I said earlier, one of the other things we did with Google was looking at debugging the plasma. So plasmas, of course, because of the nature of their very, very low density, but very high temperature, you can really interact with them with probes and things, and particularly in the interior, other than indirectly through inference from using various things like spectroscopy, bolometry, or, um, and other sort of optical techniques, you can sort of understand in a sort of columnar way in one particular location, what a density variation may look like or um, uh, a, pre a temperature variation. But if you want to understand it holistically across the entire domain of the device that, and, and then streaked out against time, that's extremely hard to do. However, it turns out if you use Bayesian inference tools, you can actually take and integrate a lot of different observations that may be isolated in time or space on a particular location, and you can integrate them with multiple other data streams. And so you can take temperature measurements, density measurements, magnetic pressure variations, and, and other things, 
And you can then design a system that can integrate all of these and matching against all that evidence, decide where's the, leak li the, the, the most likely state of plasma that matches against all of that. And then you can, of course, streak that out through the entire course of the experiment. And here so you see an example of this and what it allowed us to do. So here you're seeing actually the density varying across the radius here of the machine. The zero is sort of central in the axis, and this goes out radially uh, to the periphery and then streaked out across time. And so you can see post forming this plasma, which is sort of a bit of a turbulent process. Then it sort of coasts along. And so you can see there's a relatively stable radial edge to the plasma and it kind of sits there. But there's structure inside. There are all sorts of small perturbations that go on in the interior, maybe small in relative in terms of amplitude, but nonetheless, those can be quite effective in pumping particles and energy out. And so what we what, what we did is we actually can 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 now take these multiple density uh, these multiple diagnostics inputs and digest those and devise out of that what is actually the structure of the plasma on the inside that we can't actually touch in any significant way. And uh, you can find, for instance, there's different kind of rotational modes, structures that develop with different geometries. And then you can also plot these, of course, and you can get a good feel, for instance, in this case, it's very stable, it's sitting very circular, but this, there are other cases where this becomes very elliptical or triangular. And then um, it may destruct completely and then turn with, into a major instability that drives the plasma completely unstable and you get killed within say hundred microseconds or so. But you can also find then regimes where this is relatively quiescent. And once you have this understanding, then you can retune other systems in the feedback loop that can inform out of this learning and can make adjustments. So there's a lot of virtue in doing this sort of thing. And this is incredibly intense computationally and something even with the horsepower available at Google still takes significant hours post a shot to post process all of that. But we've made major advances in integrating more and more diagnostics to do that. Um, and here's a reference of some of the, the, the publications we've had out and uh, there have been some posts also on Google's website in their AI blog um, talking about some of this partnership we've been going. Uh, another example I want to provide here is sort of, this is really exciting because it gets to the now integrating these things to active feedback control, to really do scenario planning as Jeff called it, or really control continuously during the discharge actively what happens. And we're, there's some quite good advances now that, that, that we can do on our machine, for instance. So we can control plasma position, plasma position very precisely today. So this, this blob of plasma, I think this is a kind of football shaped object. It's sitting in this magnetic pressurized container. It can veer axially slosh back and forth. It can radially azimuthally move, move around. And we want to control that to a tight point. Why? Because if it moves too much, then wherever the beams hit may not be the exact spot where we designed and would like for it to meet. It may miss the plasma altogether if it moves too much. So a lot of those reasons why you don't want that. And you, of course, you don't want it to veer too far off. So you develop more um, heat loss towards the wall. So holding it in shape and in and, and, and location is very important. And then shape has also an impact, it turns out, to stability. Things that, for instance, are more cigar-like have less tendency to torque over or flip over. And things that are more pancake-like have a smaller more inertia, they may, they may tilt much more quickly. So we want to control shape as well. So here's an example of that, where basically um, there's a control layer, right, that takes uh, reference waveforms that we know we would like to have, that takes real diagnostic input from some sensors that say, you know, where is the plasma roughly, the centroid, uh, where are certain other conditions, and it processes these and then decides, uh, what can I feed back with? I can you change the magnetic pressurization? I can change, as I said earlier, this, these electrostatic um, layers of potential on the surface. I can change the beam injection. I can also manipulate, as, in, as we're doing now, the amount of gas that gets occasionally injected in addition to what comes with the beams. And when you do this right, here's some examples. So this is looking, for instance, at the radius here versus time. So these are about tens of milliseconds shots. And you can see here, when you actively control that, you can hold that radius pretty steady throughout Whereas if you don't do that, there's some passive stability, but eventually it sort of collapses. If you look at the axial location, a collapse like that typically means also the stuff runs away, as you can see in that black trace, which is a non-active controlled shot. And when you actively control, this now gives you sort of the sense for the excursion. And um, we've gotten this so fine tuned now that this plasma axially can be positioned within a you know, few centimeters of where you really want it. And uh, when you look, for instance, what that means on, on, uh, on coils, there's some very erratic waveforms that get deployed from the power supplies in that feedback system to, for instance, achieve that. And so those are, it's interesting that, you know, by this sort of seemingly chaotic 
uh, firing of these coils, you can actually achieve then some very stable consequences in the plasma. Here's a position control thing. Um, so here, for instance, and this is some deliberate stuff where we can now go in and when you look at this on, on, the, on fractions of milliseconds, we can make adjustments. So here, for instance, uh, is, a, is a way of um, controlling the elongation. So if you push more at the center of the plasma in the mid plane, then the thing becomes more cigar-like. When we um, reduce pressures here, as while we're doing that, you get the cigar. When you increase pressure here and decrease pressure there, it starts to move more back towards a more spherical object. As you can actually see this here, these are the control coils, uh, red being one in the mid plane, blue being one um, near the edges. And with this feedback system that's based on machine learning, we can actually vary these things such that then we can get predictive behavior. So for instance, if we start to vary the coil currents here near the edge and reduce those, then clearly this plasma becomes longer. And you can see here, this goes from two and a half meters up to well over three meters. And then we can push it back if we start to squeeze it again. And likewise, of course, we can play with the radius at the same time. And so this allows us some very neat control over shape and position control. And in fact, now we're beginning to control then the total energy stored in the plasma and other goodness metrics that we would want to achieve. And the system continuously adapts um, while it runs. So what does that mean going forward? So we've built, as I said, about five generations of machine. We're now in the construction phase of a machine called Copernicus. We're trying to get to about 100, 150 million degrees on that machine. And we think this will get us into a regime where we can actually look for viability of net energy out um, in the next uh, about three to five years. And that's followed by hopefully what will become a prototype demonstration plan towards the late uh, 2020s. And uh, there is obviously a lot of learning that occurs on each stage, but the rate of optimization that has occurred throughout Norman's life with the availability of machine learning, both on the control side, on the analysis side of, of results and the optimization operationally has dramatically accelerated the rate of progress. And so we're very confident with these tools that we're gonna scale here much more quickly. In fact, this is what's up next. So this machine, as I said, will hopefully enter the DT relevant conditions. We're gonna use hydrogen only, but we're gonna use surrogate computation to assess what that would have meant had we used hydrogen and um, hydrogen isotopes, deuterium tritium in the machine. And we think we will get to that roughly somewhere mid-decade. Mid and so bringing this all together here in summary, um, lots of innovation is available today in Fusion. Um, machine learning is one of the critical ones uh, that, that we have found that allows us now to really scale. And I think we're at an exciting stage in the field where the technology side, machine learning, power management control, um, neutral beam accelerator technology we've developed and others, uh, additive manufacturing, lots of other things too, but machine learning and particularly in control and, 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 and advanced cycles of learning have made dramatic progress to get us to a much more accelerated and closer to goal step. And so I share Jeff's sentiment. I think the best is yet to come, but we now have the baseline tools to really, I think, meet the challenge. And I think you will see in the next five to 10 years, uh, somebody crack the nut on, on developing a net energy system out of, the, the, out of what we have today. So with that, thank you very much. I guess I, I'll yield the floor back and um, we'll probably have some questions perhaps towards the end of, of the session. Thanks, Mikkel, and thanks for great enthusiasm uh, and all this uh, progress which has been uh, coming uh, along. We're starting to receive questions and I do hope we're gonna have some time at the end. But uh, as I said earlier, Today, the focus really wants to be on giving you guys room for um, enough time also for presenting uh, this uh, interesting talk. So let me now introduce our last speaker, uh, Jonas Spurkli from DeepMind. They will tell us about their work in partnership with the Swiss Plasma Center at EPFL on controlling tokamak plasma through deep reinforcement learning. Over to you, Jonas. Oh, you said you wanted to try your slides, so. Yeah, can you actually see my slides? Yes, I do see, we do see them, but if you can go full screen. Yeah. All right. You get them full screen now, yeah? Yes, thank you. Great. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure um, to talk to you today about our work on uh, using AI to um, control a fusion device. Uh, my name is Jonas Buchli, and I'm speaking um, on behalf of a very large team actually from two institutions from uh, EPFL and DeepMind. So this is actually um, outcome of a, uh, about two plus year uh, collaboration that we had with the Swiss Plasma Center at EPFL. And I really like this picture because um, it not only shows uh, the beautiful 
um, setup that the PFL campus has, but you can see here on the lower right side, um, the housing where actually the TCV Tokamak is housed, where SPC is, uh, which we're going to uh, talk about today and where eventually our neural networks run. Um, so I guess I don't have to convince many people in this audience that yes, the world does need new sources of energy um, of a variety, for a variety of reasons. Um, and that an important and, and interesting candidate, not necessarily for the very short term, but for mid long term um, is fusion because it's highly energy dense and doesn't have any climate impacting waste products. And we have clearly examples that this works um, with the sun in the sky and, and, and the stars, right, which basically are fusion reactors. But as um, speakers before me have pointed out, um, there is a bit of a difference um, between how we would do this here on Earth and, and how the sun is doing. And one of them that has been mentioned is actually that we have to get to very hot uh, temperature, even an order of magnitude hotter than the sun. Um, and this obviously means that basically uh, the plasma shouldn't touch anything. Um, and beyond that, I mean, there's other, many, many other um, really uh, enormous scientific and technical challenges we have to solve. But basically to go back to that um, idea that the plasma shouldn't touch anything. So the way how, how people think that um, they can contain and, and eventually produce, uh, create a power plant that can produce energy is by uh, creating a so-called tokamak. And the tokamak is in essence um, you can think of it as a magnetic bottle. So basically create the magnetic field, which contains the plasma in a, in a torus-like shape, as you see here. And with using the coils that surround um, that, that torus, you can basically control um, the shape uh, or the, the properties of the plasma and, and, and steer it and keep it from touching things. Um, now, in more details of the work that um, I'm going to show you today, we have done on, on the uh, tokamak configuration variable, um, the TCV tokamak at uh, EPFL in this plasma center, which is a bit of a special tokamak because it's a research tokamak. So um, it's it has a lot of instrumentation, both on the sensing and the actuation, actuation side. It has um, allows uh, to do a lot of different things. In particular, I mean, it's in the name. You can do sort of many different plasma shapes or configurations. And here on the right side, so what I'm going to show you throughout the, the rest of the talk are sort of like 2D, um, you know, slices of, of the torus. You see this on the left side. So basically, um, you can think about this as a slice through the torus. And on the right side here, you see a few shapes that this TCV can produce. So uh, one is a very nicely stable round plasma, a high elongated plasma, a very unstable one. We'll come to that a negative triangle area and um, something very fancy, which is called a snowflake. And we will get back to that as well. Um, and this is what makes that the TCV very interesting, that you can do this experimentation on it. But in more detail, how do you do magnetic confinement control on TCV? So as I said, so basically the magnetic field um, basically uh, controls the plasma current position and shape. And we use coils to create the required magnetic field. And so this basically means that the control action that we can send to that plant are 19 coil voltages in this case of uh, TCV. And we can observe about 120 measurements, which have mostly to do uh, with the state of the magnetic field. Um, and we can and have to do that at 10 kilohertz, um, so 10,000 times a second. And very importantly, I want to sort of highlight that fact that, right, I mean, this 120 measurements seems to be a lot. But if you think about it, uh, the true state space of that system is much, much larger. You can even say it's infinite, it's sort of a fluid in the field. Um, and we're only sort of seeing it to that keyhole of 120 measurements and have to make sense of it. So now the, the goal of magnetic confinement control is in essence to find, you know, compute the program that you can run at 10 kilohertz that takes some targets of things you want to do and then produces actions, consumes the measurements and produces actions to basically create that target. And that's in essence what is magnetic confinement control. Now, there's a few reasons why this is hard. And one of the reasons is um, that this is an inherently unstable problem with fairly um, fast time scales. So here's a little simulation of an uncontrolled um, situation where um, if you don't control it within like less than, you know, six, five, six milliseconds, the plasma just goes either up or down and slams against the wall and um, disrupts. So you literally have to actively control that. And for those people that are not so familiar with control problems and the terminology I'm using, can, you can Think of that very similar as to if you try to, um, you know, balance a broomstick on your hand or um, uh, in a more technical term, this is called the inverted pendulum control problem. So it's the same, it's inherently unstable. If you don't control it, it will fall. 
um, but basically, um, yeah, the controller has to actively stabilize that. It's a bit harder here because the state space, so it's much more indirect, it's much more complex and high dimensional. That's what makes this challenging. Now, what are um, fusion control targets that we might want to do? Well, one we already alluded, which is basically the position here um, indicated with the axis R and Z of the plasma. But there's other things you might want to control or need to control. For example, the plasma boundary here in black, or um, one important one are also these legs that you see below here, um, which are very important to because that's where basically most of the heat gets distributed. And that's obviously going to be very important for um, plants that are going to eventually produce power. Um, but you can possibly think of other things like properties of the magnetic field. For example, these X points are very important. That's sort of a subtle point in the field or, or even saying at some point, what should be the flux of, a, of, a, of the magnetic field um, that might actually be useful to control. Now, what is the current state of the art? So the current state of the art is that this is done with classical linear control theory. Um, this sort of a divide and conquer where every single element of those things that you want to control, so for example, position and plasma shape, you need a separate controller. But even more importantly, you need what is called an observer. An observer is basically something that takes uh, all these measurements and um, uh, maps it into the quantity that you want to control. And this is actually a particular for the plasma shape, quite uh, um, uh, complex code to write, and in particular also to run it at real time. Um, now, with reinforcement, so we try to uh, uh, sort of solve this problem with reinforcement learning because the hope is that we can uh, greatly simplify that. Now, maybe quickly, because not everyone in the audience might be very deeply familiar with what reinforcement learning is. So reinforcement learning is in essence sort of um, the, you know, uh, a framework, an algorithmic framework that has been developed to express or to, to, to emulate how trial and error learning is doing. So uh, this is very well indicated basically with this little example here on the right side. When humans do learning, they basically are not taught how to do it very often, but there's some sort of a measure, for example, how far does the ball fly that tells how well the task is achieved. And then just by trying it out, eventually, um, the boy here will figure out how to actually do it. So there's feedback to what we call the reward, which is sort of, we call this task unspecific. So it tells you what you want to do, but not how to do it. And current control engineering is very much, you need to also not only know what you want to do, but you have to translate it in how to do it. And reinforcement learning can sort of do, do away with that level. Now, um, reinforcement learning works, as we said, by trial and error. So we have what is called an agent. So imagine that's the boy, right, that wants to learn, that interacts with the environment, observes the environment, and also gets that task reward. So basically, how far did the ball go, and observes, you know, what he did, um, and, and then um, also how far the ball flies. Um, and then sort of in the loop, in trial and error, tries to improve that. Now, there are very tremendous successes of reinforcement learning over the last um, uh, decade or so. Um, so the work, for example, here, DeepMind and board games, where a reinforced learning algorithm can learn to play all kinds of very complex board games like um, Go and chess and Shogi, or, um, you know, strategic online uh, games like StarCraft, but then also elsewhere, like, for, for example, the um, Robotics Rubik's Cube work at OpenAI has very impressively shown the, the, the promise of, of RL. Um, but just want to quickly highlight the little difference between, you know, um, many of the domains where RL has really shone so far at the real world. Um, so basically in games, you have um, what we call this discrete state and action space. So basically whenever you, you come, it's your turn and you have a finite amount of actions you can take a pick and also the game is always in a finite, it can be a very large um, state space, but it's sort of finite, it's discretized. Um, not so in the real world, where basically this is usually so sort of infinite choice of action. So on a continuous scale, um, how much you know power should, uh, or voltage should I apply? Um, and it's usually sort of an infinite state space. This also means that in games, the simulations actually are sort of perfect. The game engine is the real thing, right? Um, and we can perfectly learn against that um, with the real experiencing the real physics. And in 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 the real in real examples in the real world, physics is will never be. The, the case simulations will always be at best um, an approximation and often a very crude one at that. And so basically there's a, a big challenge figuring out how to bridge that gap. Because basically, as we said, right, so um, our learning agent has to interact with the environment. And ideally, of course, we would do this directly from 
against the real thing, which is the Topka lock. But there's a bunch of catches that sort of um, um, make that this is not easily possible. One is that reinforcement learning is very data hungry. So here, uh, this is illustrated by a little critter that needs to, by the example of a little critter, two-legged um, thing that needs to learn how to run over complex terrain. And it requires 15,000 trials to do so until it can do it very well. So these are many, many trials um, over, you know, over next, and each trial is over an extended uh, period of time. Um, and in the real top come up, so basically that's, um, you cannot afford to have so many experiments. So just to give you an example on the T, just, just example of the TCV, this varies a little bit depending from top come up to top come up, but the TCV, it's like you can do a two second experiment every 15 minutes and it is a shared facility. So you, you know, there's many people from around the world that would like to run their experiment. So at best you can get maybe a few, you know, um, a handful or a few dozens of experiments over half a year, something like that is an order of magnitude. Definitely not enough to do reinforcement learning. So the answer to that is usually using a simulation and um, uh, Jeff has actually shown one approach also how you can develop the simulations, but often um, one would try to do the simulations from sort of first principles, um, physical modeling, and that's in essence the uh, way how we try to do it here. So we used the FG simulator, which was developed um, in at EPFL um, based on, um, of course, of a lot of um, all, all the software, all the software that they had there. Um, and it's a free boundary garage, a front of solver um, added with some circuit decorations for the conductors. And that's what we're in essence using to train our algorithms as an environment. And then we take them onto the plant. There's no retraining on the plant. This is what is called the zero shot deployment. So maybe in a bit more detail, uh, we had to enrich FGE with um, a few more things. Um, to make it a bit more look, uh, make make it a bit more look like the real plant. One important thing is the power supply because you cannot instantly apply. Hi, so I think Jonas is having some technical problems because we just lost him. So we, if the others are still here, maybe we can have uh, uh, we can use this time for a few questions which we have on the chat. Okay, I see Jeff is here. Uh, Jeff, we had hi. So we had a few uh, questions for you. Uh, let me go to one of them. So, what's the reason to to choose Bayesian optimization in your uh, in your work? Yeah, exactly. So. So one of the things that Bayesian optimization is especially focused on is the regime where experiments are extremely expensive. So it'll choose experiments uh, explicitly maximizing the amount of information that will be learned by doing those experiments. Now, obviously, as we've heard from the from the speakers so far, uh, doing experiments on on fusion devices is exper is expensive. You don't get very many of them, so you've got to get the most information from them. What may be less well appreciated is that even the high fidelity simulations of fusion are generally pretty computationally expensive. For, so even for those, you would want to choose your experiments carefully. Uh, I think you're muted, Matteo. Sorry, there was another question on which kind of dynamic model did you build uh, to simulate fusion? Yeah, exactly. So we, we used a deep neural net for that. Uh, we used a relatively small one by modern standards. It's uh, five layers with 512 nodes per layer. Uh, obviously, that's much smaller than, than current convolutional neural networks for vision or, or the kinds of uh, text and language models. Uh, but for what we're doing, uh, you saw the variables we're using. It's a few dozen state variables um, and a handful of actuators. Um, and so that kind of neural network is, is sufficient for that. Um, as I mentioned, it's also an ensemble uh, of, of models so that we capture the, the variation in the, in, in the model's uncertainty. Okay, there's a few other questions on the YouTube chat and uh, maybe I can ask you those, but- uh, Looks like maybe tried... Jonas is back, yeah. Yes, maybe we try if Jonas can um, take it back. Yeah, apologies. Um, I am not sure when did I drop out? What was the last thing that was, was online? 
we lost you at the slide with the simulated environment. Got it. Okay, cool. Let me back up there and um, share. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. All right, good. All right, let's try that. Um, okay, I was talking about the simulated environment. So basically, yeah, we had to enrich the simulated environment um, with a few more things um, that made it look a bit more like the real plant, like power supplies and, and the sensor models and, and things like that. Then um, briefly about the rewards. So um, the rewards we are in essence formulating in the same quantities that are also used for normal control. However, we can do even more things which are not easily doable, like flux quantities um, and to basically use uh, if we formulate this color reward um, in, in some of the quantities you would like to have. Um, and then basically this lets us uh, train um, a controller architecture, which is greatly simplified. So basically a single integrated controller, no separate error estimation or feed forward generation or anything like that, um, which you then deploy in the plant. Maybe a quick word about the learning loop. Um, as we said, so it does require a, a good amount of data to train such things. So we would typically run 5,000 parallel simulations, so 5,000 simulated instances of, of TCV at any given time for a given experiment, learning experiment, and would uh, have this train um, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, depending on the difficulty of the learning problem. Um, it's a, so it's a, what is called a distributed learning setup um, with many, many machines in a data center and the learner on a different machine, which is in essence an active critic method that is you know, especially good at continuous state action problems. That's the uh, MPO algorithm that we're using here. Um, and then finally, this lets us basically get a control policy. Um, we use a, an asymmetric active critic method. So the, the critic is fairly large, the control policy we keep fairly small because we have to run this in real, in hard real time on the uh, control system of the real tokamak at, at 10 kilohertz or 10,000 times a second. So we have to do a few things to make, to enable this. Um, this is not how normally neural networks are run. Um, one one uh, fun um, aspect of that is that you have to make it small enough that it fits into the L2 cache of the control computer um, so that it's fast enough basically uh, um, in, the, in the inference. But just, I wanna basically take a few minutes now. Uh, we are a little bit delayed because of the interruption um, just to show you a few results. So here is one nice example where we, we basically bring in an X point um, from below. So first it's like a nice uh, st little stable plasma. And then we basically bring it down, bring in an X point and create what are called legs. Um, and you can, on the left side, you can see this in a, in a sort of a visible light camera, which is which is pretty cool. Um, it, it, we, I think we also have this online somewhere in better quality. This unfortunately doesn't always come through on, on uh, Zoom so well. Um, yeah, here's actually that shot in a bit more detail for, for people in the audience that are, are interested in this kind of things, right? So we, we really show that basically can track uh, relevant quantities like IP here, about the plasma current that goes around the torus, and at the same time, the, the axis of the plasma, the, the position of the plasma, the position of the X point, um, then RMSC here, the shape RMSC is sort of a measure how well we track the shape, so how close is the shape out from these blue desired points um, in average. Um, and then also the last one is, a, is an interesting one, which is in sort of shows how unstable the plasma is um, with the growth rate. Um, we did uh, a, quite a, a number of different configurations uh, because we want to show that uh, we want to do, convince ourselves and show that this is you know, useful for, for many different shapes. And by now we can basically train with, with one single reward function and many different shapes and then basically just by by giving different targets that shape can uh, be elicited um, um, it's still separate policies but we use the same reward function on the top left here is a high elongation plus but it's interesting because they typically are very unstable this is 1.9 um, then uh, this one here is interesting um, as it is sort of a, a standing shape for what might be running on ether at some point and then we add heating neutral beam heating at some point which is a disturbance to the controller on um, the lower left side, we have a negative triangularity plasma, um, which we track where we track the triangularity. And then um, the lower right is what is called the snowflake. And those are interesting because you sort of, uh, with those, the hope is that you can sort of distribute the heat better with all these um, uh, leg configurations that you have here. Um, and so this might be interesting for power production in future. So uh, this brings me to the end. Um, uh, so the outlook basically on this work, so we, 
we want to improve on basically um, our uh, control implementation as many things that can be done better it's also only a very specific part of the problem that we're looking at um, so basically we would like to use rl to you know ultimately optimize plasma performance so the q value has been mentioned right but really in the end what counts is you know q larger than one or ten right i mean to make so that this becomes uh, actually economically viable um, can you use our rl to actually directly optimize for that you run into a formidable simulation challenge there um, but then one that one that we're very excited about is that hopefully um, such optimization methods and, and learning methods ai can help you know co-design actually um, so sort of very simultaneous design your your plant um, with the control method and possibly can do things a bit differently so in conclusion um, we have so far shown that um, we can use reinforcement learning basically to uh, solve the magnetic control problem on a tokamak um, and so models are really key uh, to perform the required simulations and the models that we have are already good enough for the problem we have seen here yeah, it's not like good enough for everything so um, that's actually uh, very complementary what Jeff has been showing so we, we're convinced that eventually you want to enrich simulations with some data um, uh, sorry uh, uh, first principle model with some data it's not something we have done here um, again for reason of focus um, and we think there's a bright future also for applications of RL in, you know, in other fields, both, or both in plasma, in the field of plasma and uh, fusion, and uh, the wider field of control, because basically um, this example is also what we believe a little bit of a milestone for RL in the wild. Um, it's, you know, such a high dimensional state space, continuous state space problem. Um, you don't see solved that often by RL thus far. So. Um, so this brings me to the end. I think, unfortunately, we're a bit out of time, but if there's any, any quick question, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, and uh, I'll leave back to Matteo. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, you made it right on time, and uh, um, thank you for, for trying. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, there's, there's a few questions. Uh, so there's one, we read a couple for, for Jeff, so let me read uh, one or two for you. Um, so what, are, what approach to sensor fusion do you use? Uh, are you able to add sensor without sensors without retraining? I don't know if it, Jonas? Okay, maybe you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, was that a question for me? Uh, yes. Can you repeat uh, that again, sorry. What approach to sensor fusion do you use? Are you able to add sensors without retraining? Uh, no, I mean, we're, we're literally consuming sort of the raw data um, from the plant. I mean, there is, there's some um, signal conditioning that is going on. Um, uh, that is just a standard thing. Um, then we're consuming the, the raw value. Um, these are mostly flux uh, measurements. And, and, um, and so, you if you if that would were to change in the current situation you would have to retrain your policy so there's no general knowledge that is sort of extracted by the rl algorithm at that moment of time jeff i think you could answer that one too and Jonas, could you please stop sharing if, if possible jeff yeah, yeah yeah i happy to comment on that my my answer is the same, essentially the same as jonas's what we uh you know, our model is trained, uh, you know, with, with exactly the, the data we have, the sensors we have. And so uh, if, if new sensor data was, was brought to bear on the problem, we, we, would, uh, we would recollect a data set and retrain the model. All right. And uh, Jonas, there was another question from you. Uh, how does the model end up being so reduced? Was this a big effort of the development? Um, that's probably a question that my, my fusion friends would probably be able to answer much better. But I mean, from, from our vantage point, yeah, it was a massive effort. Um, we're obviously sort of standing on the shoulder of giants. There's, there's a, you know, TCV has been running for 20 years. There's a lot of experience that went into formulating these models. Um, then just that final step of making FG is in essence, a whole PhD thesis, um, and built on a lot of other software. So yeah, I would answer that, um, definitely in the positive. Okay, there's a question for both. How many virtual shots uh, does the reinforcement learning method need to achieve the performances showed? Can you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I'll, I'll say in the, on the order of uh, hundreds of thousands. 
Jonas, what's your yeah? Take? So um, I, I don't know the number at the top of my head, but if you want to if you want to make the uh, calculate the number, so basically we run five thousand simulations in parallel. Let's say um, one um, episode or an experiment, simulated experiment, takes about ten hours, um, and we run over several days. Now, so basically, so it's you know um, if you run three days or whatever, it would be like, what, 15,000 or no, yeah, 30,000 experiments. So a lot. Uh, Jeff, there was a, there were, there are a couple of questions on the live chat on YouTube. I'll try to read a few, even though we're running out of, we, we already ran out of time, but uh, I'll use the excuse that we had a technical glitch. Um, so have you tried to implement the reinforcement learning controller in real D3D experiment? Uh, it, yeah, so we so we've got time scheduled on D3D this this summer. This will be our first chance to uh, to run our policy on it, and uh, you know I hope to be able to report back on, uh, on how that goes. Uh, of course, we will not be able to run RL in the sense of you know repeated trials, learning between each trial, uh, just because of the small number of shots we'll have allocated and the and the time between. Right, and uh, well, there was a question on what is the advantage of using a learned simulator rather than a physics-based simulator for the dynamics? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So the, as it turns out, we didn't really appreciate this when we started that many of the physics-based simulators, the real goal of those simulators is scientific understanding. They're, they're basically tools for the scientists to understand if they adjust one knob, what effect will that have on the other variables in the simulation? What they're not well configured to do is to be an accurate simulation of the whole range of, of the state space and the controls that you might apply. They're not accurate across all the regions you might never go. And unfortunately, a reinforcement learner or really any kind of machine learning algorithm wants to go off and explore all of that. It wants to explore that whole space. And so it turns out that using a, a, a physics simulator, even though it may be very useful to scientists, it's often not that productive uh, for a learning algorithm that, that may just discover the flaws in the simulator. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jonas, uh, if you're still here with us, I don't see your video, oh, great. Uh, is the FGE simulator open or covered by IP? Um, that's actually IP of EPFL. So basically, if you if anyone is interested in that, um, get in touch with with Cosmo Center and have a chat with them. Okay, and uh, then could you discuss any reinforcement learning methods that you trialed that did not work so well, or did you settle? On actor critic from the start, and if you can, if you can answer this, sure. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, we did not actually experiment with a lot of variety. Um, we sort of uh, picked the one that we were convinced is is sort of the best bet, which is MPO, um, which has proven itself quite a bit in in like um, hard continuous state action spaces, and then ran with it. Um, and we were not forced to basically, um, you know try other things because it did work. That part did work very well. Um, that's not to say that there is not room actually for experimentation and there might not be improvements. So, you know, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, especially I thank all the participants which stay with us uh, both, both on the neural network and on YouTube. We had uh, really a, a big crowd today and I, it's been fantastic. Uh, I think today was, a uh, we you, you guys, thank you very much, great, gave a, uh, fantastic overview of how AI is being used in fusion research, fusion science, and how is uh, accelerating this field, um, advancing fusion science discovery. And I thank you also, Christina, for presenting the new IA project on AI for fusion. And if anyone wants to get in touch with us, please do. Uh, you can either Google AI, IAA AI for fusion, or you can uh, use the contacts which uh, Christina uh, showed on the slide. This will not be the last time uh, we, you will hear about fusion research and AI on the AI for good. In fact, we will soon come back and uh, hopefully with uh, some more in-depth sessions on the applications and also with updates from the coordinate EIA project. 
So thank you and uh, see you next time. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.